Welcome to another edition of the SprintCarLimited.com Deep Dive presented by Entrust IT Solutions. Joining us on the show today is entertaining crew chief Tyler Swank. Before we get to Tyler, don't forget to check out Entrust IT Solutions. Entrust is a full service technology company serving small and mid sized businesses in New York, Pennsylvania, and surrounding areas. The staff at Entrust IT Solutions takes a personalized approach to technology. See why customers are choosing Entrust IT Solutions as their technology partner by scheduling a free consultation at www.entrust-msb.com or by calling 717-292-8868. Here's Tyler. Tyler, welcome to the deep dive. Hey, thanks for having me. You're a real fucking pain in the ass, Jeremy. <laughs> I figured I'd I whittle you down and just just <laughs> till you finally came on. Well, I sat at home for three weeks. Well, I was at my parents for one week, but sat at home for three weeks, not doing anything on my extended Thanksgiving break. And don't hear from you. You don't send an email. You don't send a carrier pigeon with a oh. love letter. But I finally go back to work for a couple of weeks before Christmas. And, hey, man, I need you on a podcast. <laughs> Ratings must be shit. So here we go. Here we are. No, that's not true. I called you. <laughs> so to jump in, you're in your truck. You're in Ohio. You live in Iowa. What are you doing in Ohio? What What's going on? I thought you'd be sitting in front of the Christmas tree or, or something. And here you are driving around Ohio. You're at Kistler. You're here. You're there. What's going on? Well, I, uh, it was snowing back home, so I thought I'd let it follow me out here to get it out of there. I'm taking one for the team, <laughs> but now um, I'm working for uh, Tyson and Susan Oakman. Uh, they're going to have a team for uh, that Bryce Lucius kid from Finley, Ohio. I raced with him a little bit last year when I was kind of bouncing around and they decided that uh, they wanted to see if they could get him going and help jumpstart his career and, they, unfortunately, they uh, for them, they uh, got a hold of me and we worked something out. Here I am trying to get going, trying to, you know, knock some stuff out before Christmas before we get really busy in January. So I've seen Bryce, uh, up and coming kid. How old is he? And and what do you what do you see with Bryce? I mean, you worked with him a little bit. Uh, I saw him at Bridgeport. I've obviously seen him on uh, on Dirt Vision and Flow and whatnot. What are your thoughts on Bryce? Uh, he's, uh, he'll be 18 March 2nd. Um, I guess rate most of his, when he, when he was little racing or younger, he was, uh, did a lot of pavement stuff. So a couple of years ago, they got a 305 car and raced around Attica and Wayne County and wherever else they race some things at around here. And, and here we are. And I think he, you know. He he, uh, he seems like he's got some. Yeah, it seems like he's got a lot of talent. Uh, just very raw, very green. But just the few races we've done together, it seems like he he says all the right stuff. So you know, I think he knows what he's feeling and kind of has an idea what he wants to feel. Now we're going to work on you know some of that and then teaching him along on you know like changes on the car basically i've it's you know we're building up you know a race team and if eventually i i think we could get it you know maybe at some sort of a you know i call it like, like the elite teams or the you know the kkrs tsrs the big games and, and all of them but uh kind of more in a mentoring coaching role so to speak you know not only with the race and stuff but Hey, we're going to teach him a little bit about life here a little bit because we're going to take him out, race him quite a bit. That's the plan. So, yeah, look, looking forward to it. It's kind of a, you know, they always tell you there's no pressure, but I, uh, <laughs> this, this deal here, this deal here might have a little less, but when I, when people are spending the kind of money they're spending, you still have to have results or, you know, we just need to continue to, you know, get better from race one to race two learn from our mistakes and try not to, you know, try to minimize that, uh, making the same mistake again. 
just go from there. I'm actually kind of looking forward to it. So, so, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on was not only because you look like, you know, you belong in the band Alice in Chains, but, <laughs> but <laughs> also because, uh, you know, your history. I don't think a lot of people know your history. And I want to go way back to when you, what first got you into racing? I mean, you played football. I believe you wrestled also in high school, uh, which makes sense. But how did you end up getting into racing in the first place? Um, my dad and my dad, my grandfather and myself, and sometimes my mom and sister, we'd always go down to Knoxville. Well, let's back up. When I was little, my dad used to drag, before I was born, my dad used to drag race. And unlike a lot of, you know, like a lot of things, I screwed that up for him when I come along, <laughs> but we would always go to Eddyville and stuff like that. But uh, that's a little town and kind of Southern Iowa that has drag races. So, and my dad, that's where he raced. So we would always go down there and all that. Well, we started going to the sprint car races, you know, which was pretty cool and, and all that. Just, just started out as a fan. We wasn't born into it or anything like that. But um, there was a guy, a couple local guys at Newton, and one of them, uh, Bob Weave, my, him and my dad used to drag race when they were younger. and They'd known each other, so we just go up there and hang out at their shop. And I found myself at like 13, 14 years old, riding my bike up to a shop to hang out, pester them and all that. It's kind of snowballed from there a little bit. Did that a little bit when I was in high school, my senior high school. That's when Bill McCroskey uh, had Terry McCarl's deal in Newton. Uh, Troy Renfro was a mechanic in that one. So a couple buddies of mine that were older because all my friends in high school were old i'd never you know i had friends that were my age but just being around kind of my parents and my grandfather and you know hanging out at a race shop i my, all my friends were older and when i say older they were in their late 40s you know early 50s so a couple of them started do bill mccroskey so we started going up there and hanging out up at uh Terry's shop was and I helped them the I think it was the summer before my senior yeah it was the summer before my senior year and we got to do a lot more I got to travel with them some and just kind of I didn't really know it at the time but just kind of see what uh, like a professional racing team did because you know we ran Knoxville and Houston's but then we just I, I think I think probably race I don't know I probably went with them like 60 sometimes from that start of that season to the end and i'm like man i'd kind of like to do this and when then the next year i think uh renfro was working on uh, gilly's car and i just you know i was graduating high school and i was going to college all that so when i could fit it in i would just i would go out if they were in the midwest i'd go help uh troy and them herrera was driving the car then and i'm kind of we got to think and it's like man i'd like to try this and just kind of snowballed from there that next year at 97 uh leonard lee was working at uh, bill mccroskey's dealership and uh, he was going to branch out a little bit and race more i worked with him for three years and then it just kind of in 2000 i got my first outlaw deal and it just kind of snowballed from there I, something i was just going to do for a couple years or until I was like, you know, until I was 25, you know, like I hit 25 and it's like, okay, maybe I'll do it till I'm 30, hit 30. Yeah, I, I could do this for another five years. <laughs> well, here I am 47 years old and I've given up on saying, I'll just do this another handful of years. I'll probably be doing it when they're sticking me in the ground. So 2000, who was your yeah. first world of outlaws gig? Uh, I worked for Craig and Linda Cormack on the DOCC car. Um, Johnny Herrera drove it the first year. Then the second year, we started out with Johnny. And, you know, back then, he used to say, you know, we call it what it was. They fired Johnny. Nowadays, it's we parted ways. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, Johnny left, and we ended up with Jason Myers and finished 2001 out. And then Craig uh, owned a bunch of Burger Kings. And I think he was trying to downsize. Basically, he was trying to retire. So 
you know, when, when guys that are spending the money decide to retire or, you know, scale business back, usually the first thing to go is the race car. So all that stuff went out to Brownsburg with Davey Whitworth. I was working for Davey Whitworth those two years and he went out, raced with Joey for a couple of years and I went home for a year and raced. You ended up with Donnie shots at one point. Yeah. Uh, uh, the end towards the end of 2002. How long did that last? And what was it like when, I mean, at that point, Donnie was, I mean, I think he was rookie of the year in 96. Uh, he was starting to come into his own. I thought the 2000, 2001, 2002 world of outlaws roster. I mean, if you look back of it now, you have eight hall of famers on that roster, but you worked for Donnie for how long? And, and did you know Donnie was going to be Donnie? Uh, end of 2002, they let uh, Kenny Woodruff go in another parting of ways. And um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love that term. You just can't say we fired the bomb. We got, we parted ways. So, you know, for a bunch of Trump loving hillbillies that our industry is, we sure are do keep stuff politically correct. At true, times, true. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> so, uh, Donnie had been doing it for a couple of years or a couple of years, a couple of weeks after Woodruff, you know, got let go. And, and I was out in Lincoln, Nebraska, we were done racing around home and I was actually looking for something just to finish the year out with. And Shane Anderson was taking care of Donnie's car. And I just went out to the hotel. This is, I was with my, uh, I was engaged at the time to my uh, future ex-wife. And so we, uh, I was out, of, she was in Lincoln, Nebraska. They were out there running Eagle. So I went out just kind of, I really wasn't looking for anything, but you know, just that wasn't my intentions. I was just going out to see a couple of my buddies and Shane was out there by himself. And I think I helped him, you know, he was trying to service the drive line and all that. So I helped him take it in and out and all that. And he, you know, if I remember right, he's like, what are you doing? And I said, I said, well, nothing right now. He says, I'm kind of looking. He goes, hey, I'm shorthanded. He says, you want to come work here? He goes, Danny and Diane and Donnie's getting in later today or tomorrow or whatever it was. He goes, I'll say something to him. And I'm like, yeah, but I, I'm just kind of looking something to finish the year out. I don't want to, you know, commit. Well, after the first couple races, it's like, man, this is pretty cool. And, you know, so I ended up being there till the end of 2004 because that's when I married my future ex-wife I thought I was getting off the road you know gonna do that but here I am again so you can see how all that worked out but um yeah I we kind of I think everybody kind of started seeing glimpses maybe two two thousand two thousand one two thousand two you know he was just he, he could never qualify but he would start towards, you know, the format was different back then. So if you didn't qualify good, you know, you usually you couldn't advance your position in the heat races. So you would start, you know, probably 14th through 20th if you didn't have to run the B. And he was always run the thing up in the top five. And, you know, he was even back then, I think in his early years, he was kind of a hammerhead a little bit, but he'd learn patience and, you know, smart racer is going to beat a dumb racer eight out of 10 times. So he just, yeah, to answer your question, I, you could see that he had it back then. And I didn't really know if 10 championships, or however many Knoxville nationals wins. And, you know, I, well, he's up over 400 wins now, isn't he? Or something uh like that. I mean, yeah, I'm sure he's over 300 outlaw wins to, yeah. and if you add everything else, I'm sure. Yeah, he, well, yeah, whatever it is, a 300 or whatever. Yeah, I'm talking about outlaw wins, yeah. and, you know. But yeah, you kind of seen glimpses back then, and so yeah, you could. I didn't, you know, I, I in my, you know, my personal opinion, and granted, I'm biased a little bit. I, I still say, and he's he's the goat, you know. But it's kind of hard to have that debate because between, you know, like Steve's era, and Donnie's era, you know, everything's just different. So, you know, car wise and just everything like that. So it's, it's hard to it's hard to, I guess, 
you know, not fair to either one of them to compare, but I, you know, he's definitely a top three in the world of all time. And he ain't three. No, 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 he's not three. What from there when, you know, obviously the marriage thing didn't work out. You and I have something in common there. So, so <laughs> where do you, yeah, uh, I mean, honestly, she's a great human being, awesome person, but it just, you know, uh, that would probably be my advice to young people is maybe wait till you're 30 if yeah. you're going to do it, you know, don't, don't get in a hurry. Cause they, maybe that's another set. We'll talk about, we'll talk about, uh, marriage counseling at the Christmas, the Christmas special we'll do, but <laughs> anyway, yeah, I will, I, I'm gonna, you. go ahead. No, I'm going to chip in one thing. Live with them first. Yes. Yeah. It's our advice. This is marriage counseling with Tyler Swank and Jeremy Elliott. There you go. That's yeah. What not to do. It's like, I've always said, I always wanted to, you know, do a diet program, but I just want to be the before picture. I don't want to do the stuff to be the after. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm, I I got to get to the after, that's for sure. But where so so after whatever marriage stuff goes, where do you end up? How do you end up on the road again? And where where did you where did you go? Uh, in two thousand five, I I was trying to quit, but when you're still working on a race car, it's hard to quit. Yeah. So I was living in Lincoln, and I was driving back and forth working with Ricky Logan. He was driving Mike Vanderecken's car, and I figured that was just you know, I could get my fix while I figured out what it was I was going to do, you know, for the rest of my life. And then, you know, I actually got married at the end of two, see, this is how long ago it's been. I actually got married at the end of 2005. So I, after 2004, I went, we did live together for a while. Oh, good. But, um, it got to be about that fall and I, I sat her down. I'm like, Hey, look, I said, I'm not programmed to be home all the time. I'm not programmed to have a regular job or any of that. And I said, I said, this sounds selfish. And then it was, but I said, I was just kind of starting to get to where I was figuring some stuff out. Cause even, you know, with Donnie and I, we were, we, we always kind of joke. We were just a couple of young idiots just throwing shit at the side of the wall and see what would stick, you know, with what we were doing. And we, we won quite a few races and stuff like that, but not really understanding anything or, you know, anything like that. But I, it's just, if things were kind of s slowly starting to click a little bit, but um, I just sat her down and I'm like, Hey, I said, I want to go racing again. And she's like, Hey, go for it. So I went to work for a Rudini year on the back the year of the uh, second split. The NS, whatever they call it, the NST or the, yep. I think it was the NST outlaw split then. And, but we only ended up racing probably 26 or 30 times. And that didn't quite work out for everybody. And the next year I raced with Chad Hillier in 2007. And I left that in the old minute season to go work on for big game on, on Terry's car again because i figure well hell it's 20 minutes from the house this is a no-brainer so made that work for i don't know a few months and then i ended up in an engine shop middle of 2000 i think it was 2008 yeah the kind of the beginning of 2008 i'd say about march or april I ended up in an engine shop because that that was you know you're always learning stuff every day but i've always that was one thing that I, I lacked was just basic knowledge. You know, I knew how engines work, you know, combustible engines, but just, you know, kind of the tune up and, mm -hmm. you know, certain things like that. I need, I felt like I needed to understand more. And to be honest with you, I, I couldn't get a job racing with anybody. So it's like, so I went to work for Lee Nelson at Austin's racing engines. And I just walked in his office one day and he says I was cocky, but I, I, guess i don't remember that but i was like hey you know i walked in there and i'm like hey i said i need a job and i said i know you need help and i said just i'll just you know and all that and so i went to work there and a couple weeks later he sat me down he goes 
So he goes, what is it you want to do? And I said, well, I want to race. And he goes, but, but I said, I know I need to learn about engines. And he goes, I'll tell you what, he goes, you give me a year. And he goes, cause he was shorthanded. He goes, you give me a year and then I'll teach you everything that I can in a year. So <clears throat> he was a, you know, pretty big part of helping with my development and all that. I think I was there for a year and a half, maybe two years. It all runs together. But then in 09 and 10, I was in uh, racing hell and had to run the ASCS 360 deal. Oh, purgatory. No. Yeah. And I was worse than purgatory. Holy cow. It's like, I don't know if anybody has ever watched the Netflix show Lucifer, but if you, <laughs> uh, but if you have that two years racing that deal, the 360s was my hell loop. <laughs> If you if you end up in hell, it'll be a loop for eternity. That's what you'll have to do. Yeah, that's probably my hell loop is going up and arguing with Tommy Estes Jr. about, <laughs> hey, why can't we time trial? Well, we pill draw. Well, you got 80 fucking cars here. <laughs> Can we do something to, you know, if I draw a 79? I know there was one race where I think we passed the third or fourth most amount of cars. And we, we were like in the middle of the B main or or. The qualifier, I don't know, remember how they did it. They just, you know, that it, but then you had to, then when you went and draw to your pill, you had to pay 10 bucks. They called it an entry fee. And it's like, whose pocket is this going in? <laughs> it's like you're running a Ponzi ski. Oh my you know, God. we get money for every set of heads we sell, we get money for every tire that has ASCS stamped on it. You got to pay $10 to draw a damn pill. It's like, gee, many Christmas. I thought these 360s were supposed to be an economy class. No. Man, they're just sticking it in without the lube. <laughs> yeah, I I never knew the understood the ASCS deal, but so you're there. How do you end up at Canaric? Um, after that, let me think. I think I went back to the engine shop again in 2011. Well, about the Nash. Let's see, what was I doing? No, 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 no. I went and worked in 2010 and 2011. And I was at the engine shop again. And I might be overlapping some dates. Yeah, you know, I always used fine. to make fun of people because they could never remember anything. Well, I'm to that point now. But um, I went to work with uh, Jessica Zimkin back when she was driving for Tony. Oh. So I was there for a short time. And, you know, like, you know, then what I circumstances, you know, I kind of wanted to go home, you know, like uh, something like that. So I left after uh, we raced somewhere in New York and I actually rode back to Indy with Rob Hart because my ride was coming out the next day to bring me home. And he had David Gravel's family car then. So we just, I just rode home with them and all that. And then I, I was a week or two later, Rob calls. He's like, Hey, he goes, do you have anything lined up? And I go, no, I don't. He goes, well, do you want this deal? Then I said, what do you mean? He goes, hey, look, he goes, after the Nationals, he goes, I'm done. He goes, they don't know that yet. But he goes, I want to find them a replacement before I stay home. He goes, would you be interested in it? And I'm like, hell yeah, I'll do that. So after Nationals, Rob Hart, we laughed because Rob Hart drove the rig in at the Nationals and unloaded it. After the Nationals, I helped load it up, and I drove the rig out. So that started my tenure with gravel. And I got to stop you there a little bit because okay. you and I talk about David a lot. Yeah, I saw David in here a a, a good deal, you know, and and, and whatnot. And I all I thought this is when I got right. I thought David Gravel was going going to be an elite sprint car driver at some point, and that was when he was in his eighty nine. Yeah. Did you have that same feeling? Uh, that same year that I went to work there, Rob and David come in for just a, lo I think it was just a local show. And I don't remember where he finished, but I know he kind of started mid pack and he passed a bunch of cars. And I said to myself, one, who the hell is this kid? <laughs> and two, how do I work with someone like that? Well, lo and behold, Rob Hart, I got, I guess I got to give him an attaboy for helping a brother out there. But, but yeah, I, that was the first night I noticed David Gravel. Then when we raced together, it's like, man, this kid's got it. He, you know, he was doing stuff with the race car. Cause we, 
we always talk about it, you know, in the just driving the board, keeping the wing in clean air, you know, drive the wing, don't drive the car. Well, David was driving the wing before he even realized he was doing it. You know, Donnie, that's where, you know, you ever notice Donnie never follows a guy in most of the time, no. unless it's, you know, even if the, even if the line that he has to take is not ideal, he's just keeping air on his car. David was doing that at a young age, but David, I don't think realized he was doing it. But yeah, I, when we first started racing together, we ripped off like, oh, I don't know. There's the first three or four races. We were like top two, uh, top two, top three every night. The third race together, we were at Fargo, and that's when the shots has had uh, was promoting the Fargo track, and it was an all star race, and Donnie raced it, and. Donnie drove by David, and then David drove back by Donnie. They had a pretty good little race. Donnie ended up winning it, but I think we ran second that night to Donnie. And I'm like, man, this kid just got it on with the best. So, yeah, and he wasn't even – I mean, I don't even know if his balls had dropped in. I think he was only like 18, 19 years old. So I, I still look at him, and a guy go, man, there's that 19-year-old kid I used to race with. Well, shit, I think he's 30 now with a kid. <laughs> yeah. So – but yeah, I thought David's done all right for himself. He should really think about doing this for a living. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's already a first ballot Hall yeah. of Famer, so eh, it's not bad. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> so yeah, I think he put the you know you know how you always you know you know and I always talk about how people throw good and great around too much. They do. You know that guy's a really good driver. That guy's a great driver. No, he's okay. Yeah. You know. You know. You and I. I've talked about numerous times. Well, I think once he finally won his champ, his first championship, and I say his first one because I think there might be a couple more on the pike. He's he's hit. Now he's great. Now we can you know we always talked about he's really really good. Yes, he's solidified and he's great now. Yeah, I mean once you hit a hundred, I mean to me when this year was so monumental. He he got the triple crown with the, the National Open, Kings Royal, and Knoxville. Eldora always, that Kings Royal always kind of eluded him. And then he reaches 100 outlaw wins and wins the title. Right now, he's, he's I, and I haven't sat down and, and have done this yet, maybe an off-season project. He is a top 10 guy of all time. Yeah, I agree. You know, I know that might throw some people off, but no, he is. Really well, the, the the people that it's going to throw off or people that are going to, and it's like this with any driver or even, you know, some crew chiefs, they, they have a preconceived notion of them and they could cure cancer, win every race of the year, you know, save a school bus full of children. But there's always that. Yeah. But in a lot of people's eyes, but I think if people look at it objectively, yeah, he, you know, he might be closer to five than he is one, but he might be closer to seven than he is five, if that makes sense. You know, yes. I, I guess you'd have to sit that down and break it down. But I think maybe 10 years from now, if he sticks with this and, you know, stays healthy and, you know, because he's only going to get better. He hasn't even hit his prime yet. No, that's usually 35 to 40, maybe 42. Uh, yeah. And, and I, Depending what happens with certain guys coming and going, he's going to win a ton of races. Yeah, he is. Yeah, because he's already at 106, I think, 103. Yep, yep. so I, like I stumbled across that the other day when I was taking a 10-minute sabbatical. I was scrolling on the stat sheet. I think that Sprint Car Unlimited, not that your Sprint Car Unlimited, that Sprint Car Ratings guy. Yep, yep, does a great job. Uh, Dude, that does that guy work or sleep or anything? Because his website's awesome. It's fantastic. That's like porn for sprint car people. Yes, yes, it's awesome. Yes, there's the plug of the year. It's like porn for racing people. Yeah, pretty much. But no, David, I, I have no doubt he gets to two hundred wins. I have no doubt. I don't be surprised if he gets to two fifty. That's a lot of sprint car wins. That's a lot of yeah, at the high level too. Yeah, not I'm not you when know. I say 250, I mean outlaw wins. <laughs> right. No, I I know that's what you mean, but yeah, it's Yeah, I think he's going to be all right. So how do you end up with Canerick and Kerry Madsen? 
um, so that the gravel team family car, uh, that was basically his college. I think that they could probably correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they gave him a choice. You can either go to college or you can race for four years and we'll help get you going. But at the end of that four years, you either got it or you don't. So I, I was there the third, fourth, and or the part of the second and third and fourth year. And it just come time for him to move on. It was, it was kind of, you know, they were, you know, just, they stayed true to their word. They didn't keep just throwing money at it. They're like, Hey, you got to go find, find a ride. So we liquidated all that stuff. And I knew, uh, Kinneric was hiring and I, I don't remember exactly how I found out or if Carrie called me or if I called, I, I don't remember. I, I'm pretty sure I called them be like, Hey, I'm interested in having a conversation. It worked out that I got the job. They started there in the winter of 2013 and the, for the 2014 season. You guys had a successful two, three, was it was a three year run. Was it three years? I believe. Yeah, it was, it was three years. It was a blast. Probably the most fun. I've, Honestly, as a whole, that's probably the most fun I've ever had race. You know, top five in World of Outlaws points. I think winning the biggest race of your career, which is the King's Royal, uh, winning yeah. winning the Ironman. Uh, you guys were uh, qualify. That's an understatement. You guys could qualify. You guys could race. And really, I think it was the most successful time for Kerry Madsen as well. You were able to kind of, you got along with him and, and really were able to work well with him. Well, it, I'd had that conversation with Tony Stewart about halfway through my Canaric reign. I'm like, dude, I said, we braced together really good. He goes, and this is what obviously Tony was still running the cup deal. And he's like, yeah, he goes, when you find, he goes, in your case, when you, when you're Chad Canals, which I'm, trust me, I'm not Chad Canals, but when you find your Jimmy Johnson, he goes, you try to make that last as long as you can. Cause he goes, there's yeah. guys that, they're, they're a plus guys, but they can't work together, but you take a couple of B plus guys or B guys, you know, the, the team they make is a, a plus. So, you know, there was no shortage of equipment there. There was no shortage of funding that, you know, I think that's the first taste of what I got. It was on how to do it right, the right way, you know, and a lot of credit goes to Kerry cause he, you know, he was not only the driver, but he was the general manager. He built that thing from scratch. So, and I learned a lot from him, you know, with, you know, on team building and certain aspects like that. I still, I don't, we don't talk much anymore or, you know, our paths don't cross much, but I still hold him very, you know, he has a special place in my heart, I guess. Well, that got really soft and romantic didn't yeah it? i know it's gonna start the mood music some heart well you know flowing. it's the christmas season jeremy you gotta <laughs> show a little love and compassion every once in a while maybe you do i don't but nevertheless yeah. Bob bug <laughs> the grinch is my favorite jam so yeah he's, he's the best i got him hanging in my house year round well i like him when he doesn't when his heart gets big then i'm out yeah yeah <laughs> i like him the other way but uh you since then, since the Canaric, you've kind of jumped around a lot. I'm going to kind of condense this. You were with Stenhouse Marshall. You were with KCP. You were with uh, uh, bouncing around the Midwest a little, doing some one off weekends, whatever the case is. I think people, you were with Joey Saldana and the Stenhouse deal. Uh, then you got Sheldon, and then that didn't work out. And But I think people forget that you have a win with Kyle Larson. At Eagle Raceway, that famous Kyle, and it is a famous race where he jumped into backup 17, started eighth, and ran it to the front. So you, one of your cars that you kind of prepped, uh, Kyle Larson won in at Eagle. Uh, what was that experience like? And when you saw what Kyle did, I'm sure at that point you said, this kid's going to be one of the best maybe ever. Well, I, I always kind of knew Kyle was good. Yeah. But because I'd seen him come out with, I think he was driving Rico's dad's car, maybe when he first come out, I think. Oh, well, he had that yeah, one K. I, yeah. I don't know who's, who was behind that, but anyway, yeah, we, uh, 
it was it was actually Stenhouse Woods at the time. Matt Woods. That's right. Owned it before Richard bought his end out, but um, yeah, we started with Joey, and that wasn't going very good, and I just didn't gel and didn't get along and all of that, and so we were it was the week in Knoxville, just our I think their June show. Matt called. He says, "Hey, we're running two cars at Eagle the next week." And I go, "Well, are you sure about this?" And that was <laughs> even before I found out who was driving. He goes, "Yeah." He goes, "Kyle Larson's going to drive it." And I go, "Oh boy," you know. In my mind, I, I actually tried to talk him out of it. I said, "There's nothing good going to come out of this." No, you know. I said, "Yeah, you know, if he goes out and sucks, I'm fired. If he goes out and wins, Joey's probably gone." You know, so. You know, it, as bad as Joey and I raced together, you know, I, I still, you know, I, we were trying. It just wasn't clicking. So anyway, I'm finally, you know, he's he's it's the golden rule. Who has the gold makes the rules. So Matt's like, nah, Kyle's, we're going to run it there. He's going to bring, Ricky's going to, they're going to borrow someone's plane. And Ricky and then a couple other guys that were in the NASCAR world that, or used to work on sprint cars, we're going to come with them and crew on it. It's like, okay, that's cool. So we were throwing the book at everything with Joey and all that. And we just, we couldn't get him comfortable or going or anything like that. And we got the car down. I'm like, I wonder if I should change anything. It's like, you know what? Screw it. We're going to leave the front end in it where it's at, the rear end in it where it's at. We're just going to, you know, throw these bars in it. And if they want to change them when we get there, they can, change do what they want it did, you know whatever but we're gonna run what we got so we got that car ready through three inches and a ten and a quarter in the right front and i know you probably did that's hebrew to you but everybody that works on these things know that that's a pretty basic setup and if anybody's ever raced with me you know it, it's kind of changed here recently with the tires and the wings the way they are but but that was kind of always my go-to you know, you know, you kind of always have a setup to go to or something. If you get, if you're lost a little bit, it's like, okay, this always kind of gets you close. We just threw that in there and unloaded at Eagle and they didn't change a bar all night. They changed the right rear shock, move the tires, move the right rear in, move the left rear out, got off some stagger and he, he put on a show. True. So it's like, oh, I, I guess it can be done. So. Yeah, yeah, that was that was cool. That was that was cool. I mean, we didn't even get to enjoy it though because they had thunderstorm of the century coming in, and they had to get out and get to the airport so they get out, and we had to get a car upstairs and all that. But no, that was you know, in a roundabout way, this probably sounds like a prick thing to say, but it was kind of satisfying a little bit. It's like okay, so this package, even though it needs a lot of work this can be done, but little did we know that Kyle Larson's a freaking alien. Wow. So I've said this over the last, how many years with the way that deal ended with the way the deal with Sheldon geo ended. Um, you're one of these guys. It seems like who gets the program straight and then you don't get the benefits of seeing it work. <laughs> it, it, and it's to say it was the same way at RSR. It's just, you know, and then, you know, after the 17 car ended, I had a, I was pretty salty. I was, you know, I'm not going to get into it, but I, I just, to me, I didn't feel, feel like, you know, first year we, we won seven or eight races, outlaw races, you know, but we DNF'd 20 times. You know, the second year, you always usually have a sophomore slump sometimes. Yeah. And we won one or two races. And we just we, we were just kind of plodding along. But if I figured if we could get through that the third year, then we could really get going because you just don't go out and spend two million dollars and have all this shit and think you're going to go out and whoop everybody's ass. I think that's the misconception and everything's so expensive and we live in a microwave society. It's like, man, they, you know, man, it's only been three months since they've been together. They just can't get going. You know? So I was, you know, salty, quite a bit salty after that. And I kind of maybe, you know, since it's the Christmas season and, you know, it's joyous and all that. But since a little bit of the Scrooge here, you know, I'm still kind of got a little bit of a hard on for a couple people over there. But, you know, but I it's wish them nature. good. But it's human nature. But 
kind of after that, I guess the lesson I learned in that is, hey, man, sometimes you got to look in the mirror. You know, okay, what did I do? What did I say? What could have I done? You know, in some instances, there's, you know, you can lay it out. You can lay your uh, case out on the table and it makes sense, but there's the mind's made up. So, you know, like when I got let go from the 18th or the KCP car, I was over that in like five minutes. I was kind of grumbling a little bit when I got about two or three miles. I was like, all right, well, I guess I better figure out what I did wrong there and go on to the next thing. So. Has it been difficult jumping? Do you think you get labeled for jumping around so much? You know, I think in the, I, it, well, that's the thing. I don't know. I mean, am I? Because I'm not the one doing the jumping. You know, <laughs> I'm not the one quitting because yeah. you got guys. My yeah. f- my problem well, my whole life is I'm loyal to a fault. That is the one uh, trait that I have that is really good, but it's gotten me in some trouble. You know, just being loyal, being loyal, being loyal. Like the last deal at RSR, two uh, about the second year into that, and I'm not going to say who or anything, but and there's only a couple people know, but I turned down a pretty big outlaw deal to stay loyal to them because I knew we were moving into the big shop. The plan was to go out on the road and, yeah. you know, build a big team. Well, we moved into the big fancy shop and, you know, we were gearing up to do some road stuff and just, it's just like the chi or the yin and yang or the aura there just was off. And, you know, here I am again. You know, I just, I would like to have an opportunity to see something through. So, so I, want, I want to hit you with some things just about the sport. Uh, you know, kind of along those same lines. I, I have this contention, or I've said publicly, the most important thing isn't necessarily if a guy's good or bad. It's the chemistry within the team. If you're not all pulling in the same direction, or if you do not have good chemistry, I don't care how good the crew chief is. I don't care how good the driver is. It's got to work together. I mean, Greg Hodnett was with Al Hamilton. They did, I mean, they did okay, but it wasn't, it wasn't like Greg and other stuff. Meanwhile, Greg was with Ryan Hand at the Hefner car, did really well. So what I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is how important is that crew chief driver chemistry? I think it's more important than the knowledge part. I mean, you need to know stuff, but I think getting along and, you know, matching styles and, and all that, I think that that's more important than what you know or what you don't know. So, yeah, that's kind of a short answer for what you asked. No, but I, No, I mean, it's. But, but yeah, I mean, like, you know, we're big football guys. Look at, well, just, well Vikings, Sam Darnold. He's at the Jets, third third pick of the draft in 2019, whatever it is. Can't get out of his own way there. Go, you know, goes to Carolina, can't get out of his own way there. San Francisco. Goes to Kyle Shanahan's 49ers, you know, sits behind Brock Purdy, but learns how it's supposed to be done. Well, now he's with Kevin O'Connell. Well, Kevin's making Sam Darnold looks like an all pro, which he's played some hellish awesome football this year. Yeah. But Sam Darnold's making Kevin O'Connell look like the quarterback whisperer. You know what I'm saying? So there's a Kim, there's a deal there where they're just, they mash, they just gel. Speaking, so, you are a Vikings fan. In fact. Yes. I can never get through three hours on a Sunday without feeling like I'm having a heart heart attack because they just they blew <laughs> Houston out and they blew the 49ers out but we play the Hanover school of the blind and we have to <laughs> drive it down there and get a field goal with five seconds left I was mad at your Vikings when they play Arizona they cost me some I know because they didn't cover yeah yelling yeah. skull I'm that's not what I was yelling <laughs> you're yelling shit <laughs> that's not even that <laughs> yeah. but uh well they're going to go to the playoffs this year, so that, that'll make you happy. I think that's probably better than what you thought they might do this year. Or I, that- figure if they, I figure if they won eight or nine games, I think they're, the, the over was like – over under was six and a half. I thought they're going to win eight or nine. Yeah. But I didn't – you know, it doesn't matter how they did it. If you're – you know, the Chiefs are the exact same teams the Vikings does are right now. But 
you know, they've won as many close games as the Vikings, but everybody wants to crucify the Vikings well, all the time. This is for the Brian Browns and, and some of the other guys out there, big Kansas City. Look, I know Patrick Mahomes is better than Kirk Cousins, but this looks like that Vikings team from a few years ago, meaning the Chiefs do, like that Vikings team from a few years ago that won all those games real close, those one-score games, and then lost to the Giants in the playoffs. That was 2022. Yeah. yeah. It makes me nervous. It makes me nervous. Yeah. Just saying. Not saying it's going to happen. I'm saying they just look that way. Right. Well, do you remember a few years ago when the Giants barely made it in the playoffs and they were 97? They were the last. I think they needed yep. help to get in. They won the Super Bowl. Yep. Beat the Patriots. Yeah. You just never know. No. No. It's getting hot at the right time. Uh, you lived through the, you've lived through a lot of uh, things in sprint car racing. Uh, the split in 2006, NST and the World of Outlaws. Now we have high limit in the World of Outlaws. I think they can coexist, but there are definitely question marks across the board. Where do you fall on this whole high limit World of Outlaws thing? I definitely think they can both coexist. I mean, my heart's always going to be with the Outlaws just because I'm an old school guy. But I think the high limit deal has made the outlaws get loosen up the purse strings a little bit, you know, and when we're all make, you know, but right now where I sit, we're not going to commit to really anything, you know, but there's a lot of races that pay pretty good money. And we didn't have that two or three years ago. So just from a money aspect, if you're asking me as a, you know, as a racer and all that, um, I, 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 I hope they both make it. I mean, I don't see why they can't. So, I mean, hell, I was thinking about starting a series. We got the All Stars <laughs> back, and we still have the Fast and the Power Eye and the Honest Abe guy, and you know, you got all kinds of controversy for the uh, Pennsylvania Speed Weeks and all oh, that. Yeah. I was thinking about starting a Winter uh, Planet series. <laughs> and, so we could we could have the season opener in Mars, and then we could have a for the season finale, we could have a three day show in your anus. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and then the champion. See what get, I did there? Yeah, I see what you did. And and th this is why you're you're really good at this. And then for the champion can the whole crew gets a a uh gift certificate for free lifetime membership to Planet Fitness. Yeah, th I see what you did there, because most of them probably need it. <laughs> so um, you know. I, I, I'm seeing a lot, you know, Brent Marks this year was talking about all the components, every, you know, tires are bad, it's bad, the racing's not as good, so on and so forth. We all know now, the is the racing not as good because of all that, or did he have a down year and he has to blame it on something? Well, look, I think, I think the truth lies somewhere in between. Look, I don't think the changes made the racing better or worse. I, I, I saw great, look, I was in Eldora for the Kings Royal, it looked pretty good to me. You know, I saw bad races. I saw good races. To me, the changes haven't made a difference one way or the other. But compared to years ago, and I know that that it's apples and oranges, but where do you come out on all this stuff? And and look, do the same things you did years ago work today at all? Because you're a guy who likes to keep it simple, stupid. Ricky Warner's a guy who likes to keep it simple, stupid. Uh where do you come out on all this stuff? Uh, well, when you don't have competition in certain aspects of, you know, in this case, racing, like a tire war or anything like that, you can, when they, when a certain company, and I, this ain't a Hoosier bashing, bashing session, but like if I was an engine builder or car builder and I was the only one in the business, I'd probably get a little sloppy too. But I, th the, I think part of the issue, though, in Hoosier's defense, th their tires are crap. They just, these guys don't feel good. I mean, it's the, the day of the flick and stick and the finesse, you know, the old Donnie driving style yeah. of floating it through the middle. You know, he kind of, you know, David won a championship not being a hammerhead, but he can be a hammerhead when he has to be. I'd say he's in between, you know? yes. He's a tweener. Yeah, he's kind of a tweener. Yep. Yeah. So... Uh, the, the the these these young guys never got to race on the really good stuff that we had back in the day, 
And so I don't think they would know any different, but I think some of these, the tires, when they went to, you know, banning them and, and making them stiff and all that, I think it ruined, you know, for example, I think it, I, I don't want to say ruined their career because they had good careers, but I think it kind of ended maybe Joey's and Paul McMahon's career, you know, and I'm just using them as an example, maybe a little sooner than what it should have been, you know, because it was such a drastic change. Now I might be speaking out of my ass, you know, I don't know, but, but we were making 200 more horsepower than we were 15, 20 years ago, but our tires, the tire, the, the old Goodyear tires that we ran in the late nineties are probably better than these things we got now. Plus the wings, you could be a little more ingenuitive with them back then, you know, with dishes, you know, you could have yep. dished wings and you can move the dish around. It's just, they gave you a certain parameters that'd be five by five and, Oh, that now I think we got a little carried away with some sideboard stuff and certain things like that. I mean, the wing manufacturers love that because they're pumping wings out left and right, and they could, you know, some of that stuff is, has to be hand built, so they're missing out on that. But race teams, you know, there's a lot of race teams that can't afford to have, you know, the big teams can have 10 or like hell, I'll, this little deer deal here, I got 12 pack of tops and a 12 pack of noses. But if you're just running around home or on a local team or anything like that, you know, you, you don't really have it in your budget to go out and have three or four different wing designs. Right. So, but yeah, I, the wings, everything's kind of digressed a little bit. The wings, you can't really do much with them. They keep jacking around with wicker bills. I say either let us go up to three inches or take them off. Do one or the other. Don't just screw around with, well, you can you can go from an inch to an inch and a half now. Now in a wind tunnel, that might make a big difference, but I don't. But at the end of the day, is it really? I don't know. I'd like to see dish wings back. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm that guy. Uh, yeah, and and everybody wants to crap on about dirty air and all that. Well, I understand. You know, there's always been dirty air. So when you're behind a car and the car tries to flip over to the right because you got no air on the wings, you need to figure out something mechanical to help fix that. Well, that's where I think the tires always came in back then because your left rear would squish and then it would grow and your right rear, you could kind of control the height of the right rear by your right foot. That's what Don used to do all the time until we banded him. And I, I think, I think, you know, uh, to, if they want to fix the racing, fix the tires because it's the only thing on the ground. That's a good point. You know, it, it, and just give us, you know, and and I don't care if you got a freaking sixteen foot garage door hanging off your race car. When you drive in behind a car with a wing on it, you're going to have dirty air, whether you got a parachute or a or a top wing on it. So you're always going to have it. It's always been there. But so you got to look at something mechanical. And I I honestly think, in my opinion, if they just give us, you know, maybe not necessarily the RD12 back or the D10 back, but give us something similar to that construction where it kind of grew and when the guy goes in the corner, it squishes and stuff like that. They just got everything so stiff and where the spring rates are through the roof on anything, everything. You know, but I don't really see us, you know, doing any efforts you know they mess around with wicker bills and, and all that but they don't really do anything to make it it doesn't look like you know i don't know if there is a problem because i see guys pass cars every night i went to probably 80 races this year bouncing around i seen some really good racing i seen some really crappy racing so i think it's just kind of nature of the beast a little bit but i i don't i don't i guess i have some answers of stuff that I'd like to see them do, but again, it costs money. You know, then Hoosiers got to switch all their molds around, and it's just you know, it's kind of like the reverse trickle down theory a little bit. You know, everything to make a change, it's it just not like you snap your fingers and the next day they're pumping out different left rears. It's it's quite a uh, it, it's quite a uh, undertaking to change all their stuff around. I won't keep you too much longer. I know you're you're you've got stuff to do, but I wanted to run just a couple things by you. I did a 90 at nine today about Carson Macedo. Obviously, he's taken a lot of blowback running, uh, you know, with some aggressive moves, I guess, in midget and sprint car racing. And I my comment was, you know what, just don't do it. Only because 
you're at the pinnacle with the world of outlaws. You drop down the risk versus reward as far as criticism, this, that, racing for less money. Some people blew back on that, but they're fans, so I know they want the entertainment value. Where do you come out on that? I, I guess I can – I'll be politically correct here a little bit since it is the Christmas season. I kind of see both sides. It's like, Carson, don't devalue yourself. And that's no disrespect to – I'll probably catch some shit for that. But there's no disrespect for the local racing or anything like that or even midgets. I'll do and that. Whatnot. Don't worry. Yeah, you do that. But <laughs> it's just – you know, he's he's racing with the best in the world, and, and he's where he deserves to be. He deserves to be a, a world of outlaw sprint car driver. You know, that he deserves that ride because he does a hell of a job. Now, I know sometimes when you're playing, like let's say you're a professional football player. When you're going against professional football players, you know, there's a certain way you can play, and they're not going to get hurt or, you know, bad this is probably a bad example but bad things aren't going to happen but if you're at thanksgiving dinner and you're a (laughs) professional football player and you're playing football with your cousins and their little kids and everything you kind of got to play a little different you know and i know carson i I dig carson's aggressive driving style i know there for a while we kind of every once in a while gets brought up but there was a year where i was going on like five or six years of yelling at him for something and i don't really (laughs) get it you know i'm not a big walk down to a guy's trailer type of guy. But if they walked by, I would say something smart ass. And I think for five or six years, I always said something to Carson every once in a while, but you know, you can be aggressive and not run into people. You know, I think buddy Kofoid, you know, I'm big buddy fan, but he was driving them sprint cars, you know, the wing cars like midgets. Well, that's not David gravel probably did him a favor by barking at him at Paducah because I think buddy's year actually got better because he started racing with his head a little more than his right foot. You know, we're not putting death sliders on everybody. You know, I'll use Sheldon as an example. He, there ain't no one in the pit area anymore on the gas than him, nope. but how many, can you sit here and tell me one guy he's taken out where he's hit them? Out? No. Yeah, he might take his self out every once in a while, but when he but he doesn't he doesn't race dirty. And I'm not saying Carson's a dirty racer, but sometimes I think there's a fine line there to where, you know, if you know right rear is always going to beat left front. So if you got a right rear coming at your left front, and you got a chance to lift. And I've never this is coming from a guy that's never driven, but you should probably try to lift and get out of it. But if it's right rear to left rear, then that's on the slider, not the slide e. And that's so, a good that's a good point. Uh yeah. and look, Macedo's one of the top five guys in the country. Oh, there's no the doubt about it. And I and I like Carson. I I I think he's you know, he he was always kind of been on my short list in my head of guys I'd like to race with. You know, whether that'll ever happen or not, you never say never. But I you know, I don't see it in the foreseeable future, but you know, I'm a Carson Macedo fan, but yeah, sometimes you kind of got to, you know, Dale Blaney always says, sometimes you got to know everybody else's cue card and their tendencies. And he's racing with a bunch of guys that he never had raced with before. And, you know, some of them guys are just holding on for dear life. And, you know, and he's he's a professional. So I think you brought up a good point with what Dale said. That's what I said in my 989. You don't know their tendencies. But you mentioned Buddy Kofoit. Five best young drivers I've ever seen as a teenager are Stevie Smith Jr., not in any order, Stevie Smith Jr., Kyle Larson, Buddy Kofoid, Corey Day, and Gio Selzy as teenagers. I think yeah. Buddy Kofoid's a future World of Outlaws champion. I think we saw that this year. He's Obviously, I think he's going to give David Gravel, Macedo, guys like that. I think he's going to be a handful for them uh, because, like you said, I think he gets it, and now he has a chemistry with Dylan Boswell. If they can keep that band together for a while, I think, you know, I think next year, I think if they're not, where did he finish this year? Fourth or fifth? Fourth. Okay. I think if he's not third, I I think the goal, I think he's easily a third place guy in the points next year. I'm not saying, I'm not going to pick him to win it, but I think he should, I think he should be third. Who are other guys you see now who are maybe 22 or, or, or younger who you see and go, Man, they 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 could be good. Oh, Corey well, Day, obviously. Kind of, huh? Corey Day, obviously. 
Well, Corey Day, that Emerson Axum's good. Uh, oh, that Days and Parsley, Persley. Persley. Kid. Yeah, he's really good. I hope Bryce is really good sooner than later um, for selfish reasons. There's a couple <laughs> kids that run around here that I, you know, I I think if they have the right opportunities to leave the farm. I, the One kid's name's, his first name's Casey. I'm not even going to butcher you. Jedrzejczyk. That's it. That's not what these guys call him around here. But, yeah, I, I think I, I think it. I think it. I think he's done all right and you know that night a kid i think could be okay and you know i there's there's a couple kids in california i could tell you what car they're running but i can't really tell you their name because i watched a lot of stuff at the end of the year and actually this year i got to watch a lot of stuff because i really wasn't committed to anything i like chance grasty yeah i was thinking of him there's another kid out there that has a porn star name that i think drives for tarleton Oh, uh, Caden Steel. Caden Steel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think that there for a while we were kind of nervous about young drivers getting into this, but I think that I even think there's more down the pike. I mean, I'm kind of anxious to see how Donnie's nieces end up being in the next couple of years because I know they're transitioning to 410s. Oh, so, okay. you know, they got the best teacher in the world. Yeah, he's so. decent. <laughs> I think, yeah, he'd be, you know, but like even, you know, you and I have talked about this and no, no one's really covered it, but we always had problems finding crew guys. Well, I think that's kind of turning around too, because I've noticed some younger guys wanting to get into the, at least I have, you know, for what I'm doing right now, I can, I can, you know, bring some younger guys along in that aspect of it too. I, you know, I know the 18 cars looking and I think the two cars looking, you know, they need someone that's kind of already, you know, paid their dues a little bit, but sure, there, there's sure. some younger guy, you know, I've had calls and messages and stuff from people that have gotten my number from people. And then, and I think the majority of them ain't old, old enough to drink. So that's kind of refreshing that we got kids now that want to do this again. Last thing I'll let you go. Would you rather work with an older guy or a younger guy? Or do you care at all? Well, it depends on who they are. Okay. I mean, it's obviously it goes back to meshing styles. So I, I don't know, right? I, the last, it seems like I'm, you know, Kerry was an old, older, you know, he was a veteran. Sheldon was, you know, he'd raced a lot, but he was green. You know, Ian was a veteran. Gio was kind of green. Aaron, when I raced with Reitzel, he was, I'd consider a veteran. Well, I don't know. It looks like in the rotation, and I, it's falling true. I'm working with a younger guy, but I, th I I'm kind of leaning more towards the younger guys because I think my career is starting to transition into maybe I need to be more of a team builder and mentor and, you know, right. Something like that. Cause, <clears throat> there's a certain amount of pressure some you know when you're trying to race for a championship and you know when the driver has a family there there's more you know cuz they race off a percentage most most of them just get 40 or 50%. I don't know maybe David and Donnie's deals a little different, you know, if they get a little more then good for them. But I think on average it's 40 or 50%. There's just that pressure that hey, I need to perform in the pit area so that guy can make a living too and it's I just with these younger guys, especially this deal, I mean, he's going to get a little bit of what the car brings in, but this is still his, you know, education, you know, so right. Tyson and Susan are providing him an opportunity to try to get to the next level and all that. And I don't know, maybe right now, just from a stress aspect, you know, I'd probably have less of a chance, you know, I've won every big crown jewel race, but the Knoxville nationals, and maybe that's just, that's that unicorn that I'm never going to get. And, you know, at this point I'm, I think I'm okay with it, but I know working with some young guys in the right situations is a lot less stressful Wow, you know, because they're still doing it for the, you know, they want to race and they're competitive and, you know, they want to learn and, you know, and all that. And then chase women afterwards to where these older guys, some of them are more concerned where their t-shirt trailer gets parked and, actually what racetrack they're at for the night or where they need to be at qualifying. So I think right now I, I, maybe some of these, maybe that's kind of, you know, being 47 years old, I think I have a lot to offer the young guys and, you know, from 
crew guys to drivers and maybe right now that's probably would be my answer probably the young guys well tyler i know you're busy i could talk to you all day obviously uh again i just want to thank you for coming on the show i know you're busy this week and have a, a lot to do before you get back to iowa again thank you for joining us on the show uh i appreciate it and i i know i'll be talking to you soon Hey, I got a new PO box now, so you can send me my check for doing this. So I'll have I'll have to send you that address. But no, I appreciate it. And I, Jeremy was just for you, all you unwashed masses, fires social media up because he was threatening not to do the Christmas show this year that we always do. But if you guys want to see the Christmas show, fire him up on Twitter or the book or Google or whatever else there is out there. I promise we'll do the Christmas show on the website. It'll be free to the public and uh, we'll come up. We'll, we'll come up with some fresh topics. So Tyler, you're now committed for the Christmas show. All right. Well, we better book it now so I can get mentally prepared. <laughs> you sprung this shit on me yesterday and I'm like, man, I got, this is the worst day of the year to do this. <laughs> well, I appreciate you joining us on the show. And again, uh, good luck the rest of the week. Uh, yeah, I'm going to need it. Talk to y'all later. See ya. Thank you. Bye. That's going to wrap up another edition of the SprintCarLimited.com Deep Dive presented by Entrust IT Solutions. Big thank you to Tyler Swank for joining us on the show. A lot of good stuff there. Also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button on our YouTube channel and also check out our daily exclusive content at www.SprintCarLimited.com. We'll be back next week with another edition of the Deep Dive.